Welcome to Begin a Speech. I'm Fred Hunt. That's Ted Coley. Ted, are our mouths moving the same? We're not glitching today like we usually do, correct? What do you mean glitching? You remember when it shut down last time we were doing this? Yeah. It was no. like... Rah, 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 rah. Okay, we're good. Our mouths are moving. Your mouth's moving. Well, at least for now. <laughs> Welcome to Begin a Speech. I'm Fred Hunt. That's Ted Coley. Hi, Ted Coley. Hi. How are you doing? Are you having a spectacular day? Oh, yeah. We were just talking about future articles for Beacon of Speech, so we got to get back in the swing of things. What is Beacon of Speech? We sell Beacon of... We, spell, we sell freedom of speech to everybody. <laughs> she, she sells seashells. Uh, I'm telling you, right now, if you go back to a year ago, I'm gaining weight. I think my tongue is getting fatter. And I think that's part of the problem. Your, your tongue is obese. Yes, I, I have an overweight tongue. So, but we got the Beacon of Speech hat again. Ted, we sell freedom of speech to everybody except for today. We are not selling freedom of speech to billionaires. Me and Ted Coley are communists today. <laughs> See, I'm wearing red. Da, 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 da. <laughs> We're marching behind the Iron Curtain. Why are we communists today, Ted Coley? Do you know why? Um, I, is it something to, to do with the Ikea? Yes. Ikea guy? Today the Ikea guy died. And I don't even know his name. I didn't write it down. I don't care. Here is the problem. That's why we're communists. Because we are... What is the main problem with capitalism? Okay? What is the main problem with capitalism? Now, we are capitalists. Me and you, we're both capitalists. But... We're not very good at it. We're not... We're horrible at capitalism. Me and you are both horrible, but... We agree that capitalism is probably better than communism or socialism. Me and you agree with that, yeah, right? Yeah. So we are, if you have communism and socialism, you just don't have free speech. You just don't, mm -hmm. right? But today we are, we are communists because the Ikea guy died today and he was worth $30 billion, okay? 30, the, 30 billion. 30 billion with a B, okay? Now... The IKEA guy, basically he took two boards and he says, We're gonna sell you I am a capitalist, I'm the IKEA guy, I'm I'm Sven or Kierkegaard or whatever the hell his name is from Sweden. Right? He died at ninety three. There's a whole point oh, to he, my I story. was gonna ask you how old he is. Yeah, he's like ninety three years old. Wow. And they said he was a national treasure to Sweden, which is where I'm going with this. Okay. <laughs> He basically took two boards. He said, here's two boards. You can make your own furniture. I'm going to sell you the boards to make your own furniture and charge you $200 for those boards. And people ate that up, right? They're like, oh, boy, we're going to buy two boards and make our own furniture, and it's cheaper than buying furniture, right? But at the end of the day, you could buy two boards from Lowe's and make furniture if you wanted to. Basically, he streamlined it so every poor person in the world could have cheap furniture, right? And you don't have to learn to make your own cheap furniture. You can just buy my cheap furniture. And my philosophy is everybody should have furniture, which is a nice philosophy. Everybody should have nice, cheap furniture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Would you say that's fair? Yeah. That's, that's fair. not outrageous, okay? How in the world did he build a $30 billion empire selling people two boards and saying, make this into a table? Basically, he was selling he was selling the IKEA way, right? This is cheap, durable furniture, and he said, you Now do you have any? Yes, I do have IKEA stuff in my house. Because we are poor. Okay? Do I would I know what that is, like from being there? No, no, because we only have a few things from IKEA and it's not big furniture. Like furniture that you sit So this isn't like furniture in no, your living no, room no, or no, what no. is it like in your bedroom? Furniture bathroom? that you want to sit on, Ted, like this here, like this chair. This chair would be luxury at IKEA. This would be like that would not be there. IKEA stuff is literally like this folding chair is forty dollars, and then you go to the end of the line at IKEA and you would buy a folding chair that you would have to put together yourself, right? So this guy made thirty billion dollars selling the concept of you know poor people need furniture, right? Now don't get me wrong, that's very noble, right? But at some point you have to say how in the world did you make thirty billion dollars doing this? Did everybody on the IKEA team get rich making IKEA furniture? The guy who ran the IKEA store, did he get rich working for IKEA? Did the lady who sell you the box get rich making the IKEA furniture? Selling you the IKEA box to make your own furniture? <clears throat> Those people all were making minimum wage, probably, mm -hmm. right? 
And it's just like McDonald's. Ray Kroc did great. All the people working at McDonald's at your corner restaurant. But the thing that bothered me about the Ikea guy is, okay, is that the whole... Well, he, he needed all that money so he could create... Oh, no, no. So he could create more minimum wage jobs. Exactly. I need more money to create more trickle-down jobs. I am, I am the largest employer in Sweden, okay? I'm the largest employer in Sweden, in, and... I need more money to create more jobs so we can go to America, right? There's an Ikea right down the street. I've been to Ikea. I, and don't get me wrong, I love Ikea, okay? But I did not know their owner was worth $30 billion, okay? Now, how much he was frugal. They said that he used to drive 15-year-old uh, uh, BMWs. <laughs> um, he wore, he wore hand-me-downs from, uh, from the Goodwill store. He was frugal. He was selling the frugal lifestyle. And the money didn't matter. The money did not matter to this guy who made $30 billion. He is a Sweden success story. He was born in Sweden and he died in Sweden. So what rubs me the wrong way about the guy from Ikea? It's a trick question. I don't think he's going to get it. What rubs you the wrong way about the Ikea guy? Right. He, all he did was sell cheap furniture to poor people, right? That's a very noble. Yeah. I don't know. what. When the owner of Ikea was 40 years old, he had a young family. He had three young boys. He was barely making ends meet with his couple of Ikea stores, right? Went to the Swedish government. They said, I cannot afford this 50 or 60% tax rate that you tax me at in Sweden. And they they said, well, this is Sweden. Everybody, we are the socialist. We are the socialist. It's what we do. We are the socialist <laughs> utopia, right? This we is all Sweden. pay in. It's what yeah. we do. Yeah, we all pay in. We all. And the IKEA goes, oh my god, I am getting raped in taxes. I cannot stay in Sweden. I got to get the hell out of here, right? And Sweden's like, no, no, you're a national treasure. You're a Swede. We're a Swede. <laughs> we're all Swedes. You sell us cheap furniture. He's like, oh my God, I got three kids, and I'm I'm getting I'm getting killed here. So one day he's like, I I can't live in Sweden anymore. It is too expensive. It does not pay to live in Sweden. He took his family and he moved to Switzerland when he was forty years old with his young family, and he went from a tax rate of like. 50 to 60 percent down to 38 percent, which is the high end tax rate in the United States. Is that correct? Isn't it like 33 or 34 percent? Um, yeah, I think it's 35 or something. Yeah, 35. Like that. But in Europe, with all the socialist nations, a lot of billionaires move to Sweet or Switzerland because they want to keep their own money, right? So he is telling you... I, did, I didn't know, I honestly didn't know that Switzerland would be that much better than Sweden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they said, and they said he hid it, he hid his money, and he, they said he was very frugal. So every time he made a billion dollars, he would take a billion dollars and put in a Swiss bank account, right? So Sweden couldn't touch it. He would put it under his mattress because he wanted to keep his money. And he's like, those bastards in Sweden are taking all my money. <laughs> Even when he was worth 15 billion, okay? He's like, well, you know what? We're opening more. We need that money in order, you know. And they said how frugal he was. No, he was just, he was basically just another rich guy, okay? Another quirky rich guy. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't deserve his money, but if you have $15 billion in the bank account, why does it matter whether you're getting taxed at 38% or 61%? Well, th that's my money. I made that money. God damn it. That's my money. That's not your money. That's my money. So he lived in Switzerland from the time his sons were right after they were born until his wife died. And I believe it was 2014. It could be 2011, right? After his wife died, he goes, all I ever want to do was move back to Sweden <laughs> and die, die in my homeland. Well, you know what? You could have lived your whole life in Sweden, but you were such a cheap-ass <laughs> bastard that you didn't want to pay the Swedish tax rates. And again, it goes back to nobody says what they mean. You know what I mean? <laughs> the guy is like, 
uh, the cheap living, small houses. Well, I got a house in Sweden, and I got a house in France, and I got a house in Switzerland. You need to live within your means. Ted Coley, you need to live within your means. Now, people would probably attack Deacon in a speech and say, he was a good man, blah, blah, blah. Then why did, if you love Sweden your whole life, why did you go to Switzerland for 40 years to vote? Well, because the taxes in Sweden were high. <laughs> and again, Ikea is right down the street. We can go to, um, not down so the street. So he did move back to Sweden? He moved back to Sweden after his wife died, and he lived in his, he died in his Swedish mansion, you know, in blah, 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 whatever country it was. And again... If you're not a billionaire, I understand, right? But somebody who preaches living in your means while doing everything possible not to pay your own taxes is very disquieting. And like I said, I'm going to use an analogy in baseball, right? Jim Tomey got in the Hall of Fame this week, right? I don't like Jim Tomey, okay, because I used to watch him. He could do one thing well. He could hit home runs, okay? To me, Jim Tomey is... Dave Kingman, okay? Yeah, I remember him. Jim Tomey was up for a contract extension, and he goes, I want to be a Cleveland Indian my whole life. That's all I ever wanted was to be a Cleveland Indian. I'm going to go into this contract negotiation, and whatever they give me, <laughs> I'll be happy. You already know the story. That's yeah. why you're laughing. Yeah. Right? So Jim Tomey went to the, the Indians, said, uh, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you, they basically lowballed him. Jim Tomey said, no, you're not going to lowball me. Philadelphia said, we'll give you four years, $40 million, or something, some such. You could look it up. And the Indians said, we'll match it. And we're glad to have you on board, right? Have you on board? No, no, no. You're, you're Jim Tomey. You're not going to shake my hand. I have you on board? Shake your head no. 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 Well, what do you mean? You said you're going to be an Indian your whole life, Right. He goes, let me go back and talk to the Phillies. Goes back. The Phillies give him an extra year and $20 million more million. Hmm. And the Indians like, we'll match you an extra year, $20 more million. Dollars. Five years, $60 million. Jim Tomey, you want it? No. Jim Tomey went back to the Phillies again. Got six years. And Jim Tomey said, hey, hey. Or, or, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jim Tomey says, Indians, six years, 20, uh, you know, 72 million, whatever it is. This time, I promise I won't go back to the Phillies. Well, he had already lied twice before. The Indians goes, no, 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 you can go to the Phillies and go ahead, right, and just have a good time, right? Have a good time in Philadelphia. Now that he's getting inducted in the Hall of Fame, he's like, I wanted to stay an Indian my whole <laughs> life. That's all I ever wanted. I'll never forget my time in Cleveland, which when, it, when, when push came to sh shove, put up or shut up, that's not the way he acted, okay? And he was a horrible third baseman. Oh, yeah. Mike Hargrove <clears throat> said on the radio when they inducted him, they said, why does he belong in the Hall of Fame? And he said, well, he hit all those home runs, and he was a great presence. He was a great leader. And he goes, but I, he goes, and again, he's on the radio. I'm not telling you a secret. He goes, between you and me, he was a horrible third baseman. They moved him from third to first because he was such a horrible fielder, Okay. So he's in the Hall of Fame strictly because of home runs. Now, don't get me wrong. Jim Tomey belongs in the Hall of Fame, right? But don't play this, oh, shucks, I always wanted to be an Indian and things <laughs> just didn't work out. Albert Bell, who is a better baseball player than Jim Tomey, is not in the Hall of Fame. And you know why? Because he's an a-hole. When his <laughs> contract gave up, Albert Bell looked right in the camera. Where's the camera lens? Right here. Whoever gives me the most <laughs> amount of money, I will play there and screw the Cleveland Indians. And that's what he did. Do you remember? Yeah. He signed with Baltimore. Yeah. And it, Albert Bell was honest, right? Well, him being an a-hole basically cost him a spot in the Hall of Fame. Now, they still might put him in the Hall of Fame, okay, because his numbers merit it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the guy who basically, aw oh, shucks, I'm just a country boy, <laughs> and I, I play for nickels on the dollar. No, you had the chance to play for nickels on the dollar, and you hardballed him, right? Which is, again, you can do whatever you want, just do what you say and say what you mean. So going back to the IKEA analogy, if you want to die sitting 
I, and I'm sitting on a chair. If you want to die sitting on $30 billion, just say, I, I want to be the richest man in Sweden. Screw all y'all. Y'all getting minimum wage, and I'm going to tell you how to have cheap furniture on minimum mm. wage. That's fine. But don't say, well, no, I'm going to make every red cent I can and screw this whole, you know, live within your means stuff. How many people who, who can live within their means have three houses in three different countries, in France, Switzerland, and Sweden? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, maybe the Jim Tomey analogy is wrong because you... My, my favorite player from the... I'm going to write a Beacon of Speech article. My favorite player from those Indians teams... And we're going to go back to the guy from Ikea. Uh, my, wait a minute, let me guess. From the Indians Yeah, teams? from the old Indians teams. Uh, I'm going to say Omar Vizcal. Omar Vizcal! I have, an, I have an article already locked and loaded why Omar deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Okay? Omar was awesome. He could play. Now, when he started, he wasn't that great of a hitter. But he was almost a 300 hitter at the end. Yeah. And his defense, his defense was amazing. Okay? Yeah. People... I would see interviews where they say they would try to hit away from Omar. You know, he changed the way other hitters hit when you pitched to him. And he was my favorite. I also liked Albert Bell because I liked it. I liked the controversy of Albert Bell. And I liked that he just was, like, angry all the time. <laughs> like, you, if you're going to be on a winner, you need... To me, no matter what sport you play, whether it's baseball, football, um, basketball, especially in basketball, in order to be a winner, you need... One SOB who's like, this is my team, and if you mess with my team, I'm going to rip your effing head off, hmm. right? And you remember Jordan, um, Horace Grant was kind of like that, but the second time around, who was the guy who did that for uh, Michael Jordan? Big, tall guy. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the ball. But Wayne Gretzky, he had, he had a guy, um, Mar Marty McSorley. If you hit Wayne... I'm going to beat you up here, and then I'm going to drive to your house and beat the crap out of you at your house. Every great team needs somebody who's going to beat your ass to protect his teammates. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> and Albert Bell, to me, was that guy on the Indians. You mess with the Indians, I'm going to beat your ass. The problem is, you know... Albert Bell would also beat his teammates' ass, his neighbor's <laughs> ass. You know, he, he beat the kids who were trick-or-treating. You remember that yeah, story? Yeah, I remember that, yep. yeah. So, and that's why I liked Albert Bell. You, every great team needs an SOB, okay? Do you believe that? I do now. <laughs> now that I never thought of it, but now that you say it. Jim Tomei was not an SOB. He's like, I'm just here to hit home <laughs> runs. And, blah, 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 blah. and don't get me wrong, you need somebody to hit home runs. But to me, Albert Bell, you know, he was the guy. I liked that guy. Because I want a guy who doesn't want to lose. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm mad we lost, you know. Yeah, that was such an exciting team. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it was like softball. Oh, so we're going to go back to the Ikea guy, okay? So the Ikea guy is dead. He just died today, okay? And I'm, I, I don't mean the slander of the dead. I'm, I'm very sorry, Okay. But, so he, he's dead. One of the things on my outline, even before he died, there's an article in splinternews.com. Are you familiar with splinternews.com? No. The Washington Post is a newspaper. Ted Coley, how are the newspapers doing these days? Not very well. Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon and who's worth $100 billion, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, billions of dollars. He bought the Washington Post, right? The Washington Post has a union. And they keep going back to the Washington Post saying, you have to cut your wages, you have to cut your wages, you have to cut your wages, right? Now, Jeff Bezos is a billionaire over and over and over. He's like, listen, this is a newspaper. In order to make money, I have to cut it to the bone, right? The bosses at the Washington Post, what are they saying about Jeff Bezos? The bosses who may or may not be named Steve. Hmm. What are the bosses at the Washington Post saying? According Again, this is not according to Beacon of Speech. This is according to Splinter News. So you have to take it for that. The bosses at the Washington yes. Post? I don't know. What are they saying? They're saying Jeff Bezos is a billionaire. You are lucky that he owns the Washington Post. If he says to take concessions, you need to take them. Because you are... 
You are lucky to have a job. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Does that sound familiar, Ted? <laughs> yeah. So Jeff Bezos wants everybody at the Washington Post. I bought this wonderful thing to Washington. Holy cow, Washington Post is bleeding money. You all need to take... <laughs> what, did, what the hell did you think was going to happen when you bought a bloated newspaper? Okay, so they all thought that Jeff Bezos was going to pump his billions in. He's like, oh, no, no. I'm, what I'm going to do is change the business model. We're going to cut all your wages so we're financially viable. Right? And all the employees are like, well, this kind of sucks. <laughs> right? And again, it's the way of the world because when I read the Jeff Bezos article, all I could think about when I'm reading about the guy well, from those IKEA, workers, if those workers know so much, why don't they just buy their own Yeah, newspaper? just buy your own <laughs> newspaper. Start your own. And again, you know what? Why don't, why don't you do this, you losers at the Washington Post? Why don't you go out and get a computer and start your own website and call it Beacon of Speech and see how much <laughs> money you make there? Right? And then they won't be making any money. They'll be like, boy, I really wish I took minimum wage at the Washington Post. I'm not making any money at this, this godforsaken place. So, again, that's why I feel like a communist today. Because I'm getting tired of the rich people... Talking down to the poor people. Yeah. And like I said, and, and I use Albert Bell. Worker, get, workers unite. <laughs> well, see, that's it. We're, we're the communists speaking a speech. Again, if you're just like, I want to die with a billion dollars in the bank, and I want to be sitting on a gold toilet, basically like Saddam Hussein, right? Mm -hmm. Then fine, just be honest about it. Say, screw you. We're all to make, if you don't like it, go work across the street at the, what's another Washington newspaper? Not the Washington Post. The Washington Times or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't like it, go work over there. Just be honest. But they're not. How do you make a billion dollars? Is, and that's the article I wrote for Beacon of Speech about LeBron and uh, Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert and LeBron James, do not, they don't think the same way. They mo both made their money the different ways. But they both are they both are not compatible in their thinking, right? Mm -hmm. They both are billionaires. When LeBron's done, he's gonna be a billionaire. Dan Gilbert's a billionaire in a different way. They both got their you know, just be honest, say, listen, I wanna I wanna make as much money as I can, and I wanna die wiping my ass with a hundred dollar bills <laughs> and screw y'all. Do you remember when LeBron James, was, he signed his first $100 million contract, and then you would hear stories like on uh, the Trevisano show that he wouldn't even tip people? He'd be like, oh, yeah, well, if I tip people, then I won't have as much money. <laughs> well, yeah, but you, you tip people. Well, this, this restaurant and LeBron James, his thought was, well, this restaurant makes money by me eating here. Because because I eat here, oh, other people want to eat yeah. here. Okay, so, so that's really they should be tip. paying him to right. eat there. Right, exactly. And that was his thing. I am really tired of that mindset mm -hmm. of I am going to talk down to you. And again, you know, there's there's billionaires out there who are like, you know, Mr. Burns. You know, and the Simpsons mm -hmm. is like, oh, excellent. How do we make more money? <laughs> yeah. Those guys I at least respect. Yeah, it, it is getting sickening. But but the IKEA guy, he just really rubbed me the wrong way when it said one of the biggest controversies in his life is when he went to live in Switzerland for 40 years. I'm like, well, he didn't go for a summer. He lived there for half his life. He's like, oh, no, I'm Swedish. Through and through. Well, then why did you live in Switzerland? Yeah. You know, just don't talk about how much you love Sweden there. If you love Sweden, you want to love... But they took my money. <laughs> You're a cat. Goddamn billionaire. <laughs> so some of the stuff on my my uh, on my outline is not topical. It's like two weeks old. So we're gonna skip down a couple of things. You know what they should do? Now, did they bury him? Do you know? Oh, that because it just happened today. They I should. Don't know. They should be not allow him to be buried in Sweden. They should be <laughs> like, you know what? You're buried in Switzerland. That would be funny. Well, but that's the whole thing. So he has three sons. He left. His wife is already dead. He left all $30 billion to his three sons who run Ikea today. Right? And they prop the old man up every once in a while. Look, there's the... You know, and if they do bury him in Sweden, they, the Swedish authorities should evict him. Or... Uh, yeah, they should, they should have a death tax for him. They'd be like, if you want to be buried here, it's going to be $1 billion. <laughs> 
One billion dollars to be buried here. I tried to save that billion dollars, and the Swedish government took it, those bastards. Did you... Ted, I'm going to be honest with you. When me and you were talking before Beacon of Speech started, did you think we were going to be talking about Swedish tax rates? No. No. And that's why I drive you so crazy, because you never know what the hell is coming. <laughs> okay? I want to talk about classic rock real quick. Okay? And then we'll talk about Howard Stern. Okay. This summer... Me and you, we talk about classic rock on almost every episode. Would you say that's fair? This summer, Journey and Def Leppard are coming to blossom. Hey, Journey and Def Leppard. Happy days are here again. There's a catch. <laughs> oh, no. Def Leppard. Do you like Def Leppard? They're all right. I mean, uh, they're not my favorite, but I'm, I'm all right with them. Def Leppard, I do not like. When I was in eighth grade, every kid I knew had Def Leppard t-shirt. They all love Def Leppard. I, I don't know why, but for some reason I always think of Def Leppard and Bon Jovi like in the same yeah, they, sentence. Yeah, they're like but, the British Bon Jovi. But I, I, the difference is is that I kind of like Def Leppard. Yeah. Bon Jovi, I just, as, as people, I just don't like that. To me, to me, Def Leppard, every album was worse. Worse, 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 so, worse. You know what it is? Def Leppard is like Bon Jovi, bon Jovi only they're not a-holes. <laughs> so, well, here, here's so, where, so now we can't have Bon Jovi on the here, Here's where, yeah, thanks, Ted. We're, look, we, we can't have any representatives from Kia, nobody from uh, um, Bon Jovi. But you make an excellent point. Def Leppard, it seemed like a good group of guys. When they started, they talked about their humble beginnings, and they were just happy to be out of England, right? And then when their drummer lost their arm, they said that they came together and they were brothers. They weren't just a band, they were brothers. Mm -hmm. And there might be a falling out now that I'm unaware of, but last I read a couple of years ago, they are still brothers. Mm -hmm. And they said, brothers fight, brothers have disagreements, but we are brothers. We're brothers in Def Leppard, mm -hmm. which is excellent. Right? Mm -hmm. It makes me like Def Leppard. Now, what do you know about the other band who's co-headlining co Journey? Um, no, Steve Perry is still not with them, Steve right? Journey is Steve Perry is out of Journey. Yeah. Right? So, there's no Steve Perry. They have a Japanese karaoke guy who comes out just like, you know, eat the guy singing Eat It, right? <laughs> and he's... I come to you and open up. Uh, that's not true. Okay? He sings just like Steve yeah, Perry. He is Oriental, but he does sing just like Steve Perry. So the rest of the band, they all must love each other, right? Ted, the rest of the journey, the other five guys, right? They're out promoting it, and I didn't write, read which guitarist it was, but there's two guitarists in Journey, and I wrote down the quote because it was so awesome. It's in our contracts that we don't have to talk to each other off stage. <laughs> Okay? Which means not only is Journey in it for the money, but they they hate Steve Perry so much that they won't even put it in his contract that he can't sing with them. You see what I'm saying? They would rather have this karaoke guy in there and then hate each other, but they they are like, all five of us agree. Now, who's the guitar? I know Neil Sean. Neil Sean was one of the guitars. Well, who's the other one? I don't. I didn't write it down, Ted. I do remember that Neil Sean was one of the two that said, "It's not. It's in our contracts. We don't have to talk to each you, other off stage." Now, do you think I'm going to get in trouble for calling uh, Bon Jovi a holes? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. One day they're going to come back. You know, when if we ever get big, they're going to come back and they're going to search through our records. You know, like uh, they do to Trump. You know what I mean? They're like, back in 1989, <laughs> Donald Trump leered at a woman. And they, they have a picture of him. Oh, look at those. <laughs> and then, you know, then it, it'll come back to haunt us. So we'll, be, we'll be doing something and they'll play a clip. Ted, do you deny saying that Bon Jovi... <laughs> isn't it true? That yeah, isn't said... it true back on Beacon of Speech number 78? Right? <laughs> now... Journey is in it for the money. I get the impression that Def Leppard is like, you know, we want the money, but we are in this together. We're all a team. Journey is like, we want every red cent that we can make off a of journey. I hate him. <laughs> he hates me. We all we all hate that guy over there. We all hate Steve Perry. Okay? I don't know if Steve Perry's an Indian. But we all hate him. Okay? We are in it for the money. 
Now, do you have any interest in seeing that tour? Def Leppard no. Journey? Me uh, no. I hate Journey. I hate Journey. I'm glad they hate each other because I hate them. So we can throw Fred and Pete in a speech. <laughs> it's something you have in common. Yeah, I hate them. They hate me. They're in it for something the money. Something we can all agree on. Yeah, we, we can all agree. We all hate each other. Me and Journey. Okay? This week... Now, some bands, it's actually funny that they hate each other. And one band was like the Who. Yeah. Their hatred was funny. Yeah. Oh, and that's the whole thing. Because they were just a funny band. A great band, and, but funny also. Every band has their own dynamics, which brings us to our next band. Another band came out, another great <laughs> band, said they are going to retire. Okay? Now, you're familiar with this band. It's a classic rock band. A band called Rush. What do you know about Rush? Um, well, there's uh, Getty Lee. Oh, well, I can tell you. I wrote, I wrote their names down because I hate Alex Jerry. Lifeson. And Here's Neil Peart, right? Yep. Here's the problem. Rush has been at it for 14, for not 14, for 40 years since they were teenagers in Canada. Uh, singing, Rush, Rush is a great band. Singing Tom Sawyer, right? They put out, in 40 years, I think they put out 28 albums or something like that, right? Great band. Like you said, I don't argue it, okay? But I remember reading a, a re, not a book, but it was, it was a review of Rush's um, records. And they said, like, the first 12 were great. And then there was a steep drop, <laughs> right? And they've been plugging away. They keep trying. They keep trying. Okay? But, you know, Rush is great. Neil Pert, okay, he has tendonitis. And he says, I physically cannot play. Hmm. I, I can play a few parts for an album. I am in great pain every time I pl play I'm going to have tendonitis till the day I die. I'm in my early 60s. I have enough money. You know, I don't need the money. I still, I'll play, I love, he was the drummer, right? Yeah. I love playing drums, and I'm still, I'm, I'm sure I'll still do a little something here and there. But he goes, sometimes you just need to walk away. I am not a young man anymore, right? And so he told the other guys. He goes, those two are like my brothers. You know, Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson. He goes, I'm done. He goes, I don't care what you do. I'm done. You know, send me royalty checks. I'll see you at your, your grandson's wedding or whatever. And I already blew the, the end. But Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson said, well, well, if Neil Peart's leaving, we're done. We're done. We don't need to do anything more. Rush is done. Rush is over. And, uh, and I wrote the quote down. Alex Lifeson said, the pressure is off. And he said, all the pressure of the greatness that they had 40 years ago. He said, he's still going to make music till the day he dies. But he doesn't have to worry about playing Tom Sawyer in front of, you know what I mean, and be able to keep up with the parts because he's in his 60s. Rock and roll is a young man's game, Ted Coley. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he goes, I want to make music till the day I die. But I, I cannot keep up with the, again, with the high bar that we set ourselves. So they asked Alex Lifeson, is that okay? Then they went to Getty Lee. Getty Lee, what are you going to do? Are you going to replace those two guys with two generic guys to just keep going on in a rush? And Getty Lee goes, nope, I have enough money. <laughs> and we're going to miss Alex, right? And he goes, I, I think, I'm sorry, we're going to miss Neil. Me and Alex, we're going to do music today. We're going to do some music. And we're going to go under the moniker Lee Lifeson, right? And we'll record some music that we like. And if you like it, that's great. If you don't, that's great too. He goes, we're going to keep making music. And if nobody buys it, then we have all this money right here. <laughs> we don't have, we're good. We are fine. We do not need any more money. And again, it goes back to the thing. They could replace their drummer with a 25-year-old. But like the guys in now, Rush said. Neil Peart doesn't have a son that they can replace him with. <laughs> <laughs> does uh, does Glenn Fry have a, a drummer son? Well, and that's where I'm getting. Every band has their own. And maybe dynamic. maybe the Eagles could like uh, buy a piece of Rush or something. Yeah. And their whole thing is, as they they said, we we've broken up. But say there's a great charity like uh, you know Clean Water Canada, right? Maybe we'll get together and play two or three songs, and we own the songs and we all get along. So we, we're just. We're not making any more music together, and we're not. 
We're not touring anymore, but, you know, we'll, we'll still see, I'll still see him at the holidays. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they're like, Rush is done. If you want to hear... See, that's the classy thing to do. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. Could Rush go out and drain every red cent out of their fans? <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, they could. But they don't. They're like, you know what? We're good. I got I got a house on, you know, on the streets of Paris. And, you know, I'll go some, you know, do winters in Paris. And, you know, we're good. I, we're Rush. We, you know, we said what we had to say. Go, if you want to hear Tom Sawyer, go back. You can download it for $1.29. We appreciate it. You know <laughs> what I mean? And so basically what I'm saying is the mindset. And like I said, communism, if we were really communists, we couldn't do beacon of speech. Okay? Mm -hmm. We couldn't. And there would be no rush under communism. Right? But there has to be a happy medium where people are not like, I am going to drain you. We're going <laughs> to. And I said this on beacon of speech. I think it was like number 10. Well, like, what, when, oh, what, what bands... Like, what's the top three bands that come to your mind when you think of bands that just that just try to bleed? Eagles. <laughs> Eagles. I'm leading the witness. Well, <laughs> no, I would have said that anyhow. Eagles, uh, Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And uh, I wrote about them lately. Uh, Foreigner, they released their 20th greatest hits album. And out of those 20... 19 of them have So they just all put the hits. same songs in different orders. Yeah, same songs, different <laughs> orders. They'd be like, oh, this is an outtake, or this is live, 1992. You see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, you have all these songs, but you don't have them in this you order. You don't have them in this order. you got to buy them. So when I think of people bleeding their fans, I think of Foreigner. Um, I think of, I think of uh, like you said, the Eagles. I think of Guns N' Roses. Um, I, I think of uh, Jane's Addiction. Because those bastards, they put out two good <laughs> albums, and then they get back together so they can like pay for their summer homes. And when I say Jane's Addiction, I don't mean the band. I specifically mean Perry Farrell. I'm looking in the camera. See, I'm like Albert Bell. Not the band. Perry Farrell is a greedy-ass bastard. <laughs> but the point of my story is, is just if, 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 if you're going to milk people, just be like, no, I just want every penny. I, all I want is the money. That's all I care about. Just give me the money. Money, money, money. You know, I'm a true capitalist. Money, money, money. And when we're doing, when we're doing Beacon of Speech, if we're successful in 10 years, okay, let's say you're, we're both 60, and you're like, you know what? I, have, I, I can't hear certain tones out of this ear, okay? Because Fred yells so much. <laughs> I, I'm so gonna, I have to retire. I'm going to go back. I, yeah, I'm going to retire. And I'm going to sue. I have ten to ninety something. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to sue Fred for every beacon of speech we ever did. We're we're going to, and and then you'll be like, <laughs> you know, I was always the brains behind beacon of speech. Screw Fred Hunt, right? And so you never, what was it? I just read it this week. The Misfits. Are you familiar with the band The Misfits? Uh, I think I've heard of them. They're a punk band, and that's what happened. They broke up, and after they broke up. Glenn Danzig said, well, I wrote all the lyrics and 90% of the music, they can't keep going, right? <laughs> and the Misfits are like, oh, no, no, no. We, we basically tricked Glenn and we own the name. So screw Glenn. And we didn't write 10% of music. We wrote 30 to 40% <laughs> of the music, right? And so that, that was in court for years and years. So you could come back and say, you know what? Fred said he did the outlines, but I helped him. And the percentages that he says are dead wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, you know, you're, you're selling the... You remember that Beacon of Speech hat that Fred used to wear? I make $1 million selling the Beacon <laughs> of Speech hat. Oh, so you, you could see the analogy, right? But that's why I'm like... I'm like, just be honest. Don't don't go to your grave saying what, what, how great you are for humanity. You were a greedy ass capitalist, <laughs> and you won. So when you win, when you win, you get to write the history. And when you lose, and when you make no money, <clears throat> us, you don't get the you don't get to write the history. Yeah, like I said, just make your tombstone in the shape of a dollar sign. I'm going to have air conditioning in my, uh, the guy from Ikea is going to have an air conditioned uh, tomb. You know, he's down there. I got the best tomb of anybody in this cemetery. 
There's one other thing I want to talk about before we go. So um, let me uh, let me get away from Rush. Because like I said, to me, Def F, even if I don't like Def Leppard's music anymore, they're a class act. I never, never liked Journey, okay? And then Rush I like, but I agree with the one article I read that Rush has not been good for a long time, okay? No, they were great no, for no, a while. Now, no, do you like Bon Jovi? No, no, <laughs> no, I don't like them at all. No. Um, when I graduated, my prom song was Never Say Goodbye, right, yeah. by, by Bon Jovi. And I used to say all the time, I'm like, man, I wish I could say goodbye to this song because this, this sucks. <laughs> and granted, I had horrible proms, which was my fault, you know, but still. <laughs> we don't want to talk about my proms. We'll talk about that off air or on air at a different episode. Okay. Now. I want to talk about one last thing. We started talking about this on the phone, then we'll we'll, we'll cut it short. We were talking about um, Howard Stern and um, Artie Lang. Artie Lang. <clears throat> Artie Lang is on Death's Store. He is he is like a cat. Okay, he's like a fat cat who, who's got <laughs> nine lives, and he's on life number fourteen. Okay. This week he came out and he's promoting his new show on Sirius. It's uh, Anthony and Artie <laughs> or something. Okay, I didn't even write it down. Okay, I could look at my my outline, but it doesn't say. Okay, but um, Anthony and Artie, he's out promoting because how much money does Artie Lang? He's our age, right? How much money does he have in the bank after working on the Howard Stern show, Stern show, making movies, uh, being on TV series? How much money does he have in the bank? Uh, I'm guessing close to nothing. He has no money in the <laughs> bank, so he's got to keep working. He, and he's even like, I gotta keep working. I gotta make some money. How am I gonna live if I don't make money? It's like, you can put anything in the bank. Do you know how much you made? Okay. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I wonder what he got paid when he was on the Stern Show. Oh, jeez. I think the last year of the Stern Show, he was probably make. and this is me guessing, not per episode, but for the year, I would guess that he was making $500,000 a year. And th don't forget... He was also doing stand-up, and he was doing movies and shows on the side. So I think just the Howard Stern show, I think he was probably making 500 grand. And he has nothing left? Nothing left. How is that possible? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, but here's the quote. See, now that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the quote from Artie. I cut out the quote, Okay. Which goes back to the Ikea guy. You know, we keep talking about rich people, who's sincere, who's not, right? Artie Lang. He's talking about Anthony. Well, that's the thing about Anthony from the Opie and Anthony show, is that he's the same guy off air. But it's not true for Howard. Howard's a very fascinating guy. He must have an IQ north of 180, which would make him a genius. I would agree that Howard Stern's probably a genius, right? Mm -hmm. But the example I always use is that Hunter S. Thompson was a guy who destroyed, like, the wealthy in corporate America, right? Mm -hmm. Which we, the more we read about Hunter Thompson, the way, the more we like him. When we say we, we mean me, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you like Hunter Thompson more, but I like him more, right? He destroyed, like, the wealthy in corporate America, and he walked a walk until the end of his life. He was a crazy maniac in Colorado and shot himself in the head. <laughs> well, Howard was like that for a while, and he was making fun of all these people, and then when he got the chance... Like, no one else has become an A-list person through the radio. You know what I mean? All these radio... You know all the people in Cleveland who left? They're like, we're going to make money in Lo we're gonna make money in Los Angeles or Florida. They all came back because they were little fish in big ponds. Mm -hmm. And then they come back like John Lanigan. He's like, I'm back, Cleveland! And they're like, uh... <laughs> who else? Who was it? Houlihan? Houlihan went out yeah. to... I'm making it big! And yeah, then but I don't, I don't know whatever happened with him, though. I know well, he, he went out there. He didn't make it big. And then you never heard anything, right? Right. So basically what Artie Lang is saying, nobody ever made it big because they were on the radio. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And no one else has become A-list through the radio. But when Howard got a chance to be with those people, the A-listers, fans thought he was going to be like Hunter S. Thompson. Like you see them through the window eating. You see Howard and these celebrities going to dinners together. And you think that Howard's going to bust through the window or, or moon somebody out the window. But no, he's going to Jennifer Aniston's wedding and he's hugging Orlando Bloom. <laughs> right? 
And it goes back to the analogy we, we were, you know, using. Hunter Thompson lived his life, like he said. Now, I don't know how much Hunter Thompson made when he, you know, I think he said, they said he was poor, and not poor, but poor compared to rich people. You know what I mean? But he didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'll write for you. But nobody wanted 60-year-old Hunter Thompson to write for him anymore. They had, heard, had their fill. Hmm. Yeah, I saw him um, on one of the late-night talk shows probably a few years before he died. Uh -huh. And he seemed pretty pretty out of it. You yeah. Know, just Well, yeah, because, Ted, let, uh, let me... <clears throat> I don't mean to get in your personal life, okay? But I'm going to get into my personal life. I don't drink, Okay. Because when I was young, I was afraid to drink and what would happen, lose control, blah, blah, blah. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs, right? So people are like, why are you like that? Right? And I'm like, I don't know. That's just the way I am, all right? But Hunter Thompson put 40 years worth of chemicals in his body and not minor chemicals. He didn't, <laughs> you know, he didn't put cheeseburgers in his body. He didn't put, you know, Coke. You know, you see me drinking caffeine. I'm not supposed to be drinking caffeine at all, right? Hunter Thompson was a hardcore heroin addict till he was dead. Right? And oh, it's like, he, he was on heroin? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I don't want to get sued. Allegedly, he was on heroin. So maybe he wasn't on heroin. Maybe he was on opioids or fentanyl. or He was on some opioid. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He was a chemist. Hunter Thompson was a chemist. And you know why Hunter Thompson never died? And I tell you this all the time in Beacon of Speech. Heroin addicts never die from heroin while they're using Okay, let me make sure I'm looking at the TV. I got to be like the TV weatherman, okay? <laughs> Heroin addicts, you know, use more and more and more, and they don't die, right? Because they build up that tolerance. What happens is they die when they go off of heroin, and they're like, oh, no, I'm, I'm clean. And then instead of going back on heroin, say, I don't know any dosage. Say they're at level one heroin, and when they went to rehab, they're on level 10 heroin, right? Well, they get clean, Right? And they're like, oh, I don't do heroin anymore. And then they fall off the wagon. And they're like, oh, boy, it's back to the heroin train. We're going to go right back to level 10. <laughs> That's what kills yeah. them. Yeah. Okay? That's almost always what kills them. Every, oh, we thought um, Wayne Static, I think he's one, um, from Static X. They said he was on drugs. He was, and again, Wayne Static wasn't heroin. But they're like, he, he was clean, sober. He had turned his life around. And they're like, oh, no, he, he was doing a ton of drugs at the end. <laughs> Because it's the roller coaster. It's the second hill that gets you on drug abuse. And Hunter Thompson never got off the roller coaster. I think Hunter Thompson for 40 years is like <laughs> way, way up here. You know, he's at a level 100. He's like, so boy, life sucks. So I'm if gonna... you never stop, then you won't have a problem. If you never stop, you never have a problem. It's just like alcoholics. You know, I was drinking a <laughs> bottle of JD a day, and you're like, holy cow, I was alive. <laughs> because he built up the tolerance from 20, you know, drinking yeah. a beer up to a bottle of JD. You know, you see those old timers, you know, they're like, I don't feel anything. I just drank a whole bottle. <laughs> yeah, because you built up your tolerance. If you went to AA and you went off and You know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, you know what you're doing. And that's another reason, because fentanyl is so strong, they're like, they overdose because you take one hit, and it's like, whoa, you're dead, you know? <laughs> because you're going straight from level one to level ten. And that's why you got to admire Hunter S. Thompson, because he was a chemist. He's like, I know my highs, I know my lows, I, am, I'm, I'm, I got a chart, I'm managing it, right? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be... I don't mean to be dismissive to drug addicts. I know it's horrible, and um, I ride on the horse with no name and all that other fun stuff. So, now, did you did you read? Have you read a lot of Hunter Thompson's stuff? Only a little bit. I only I mean, read, do you like his? Oh writing? yeah, I like yeah. his style. But to me, it's hard to follow because he's about the trip. Like we'll, we'll be doing Hunter Thompson. Pretend like we're Hunter Thompson, and we're talking about beacon of speech, and I'll be like, oh well, you know. Speaking of speech, and then uh, a bat flew by, and I looked down, and my arms were dancing. And you're like, holy cow, this is like the economic structure of the blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it, it's hard to, it's very schizophrenic the way he writes, mm -hmm. right? But again, I thought Hunter Thompson was great, but I'm I when I read, I don't have, like, if you take a left turn, sometimes I just go right off. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to read something else. I read a lot of little things. I read a ton of 
articles, not a lot of books. You know what I mean? And books just bore me. You get about halfway through, and you're like, oh, I already see what's going on. And if it's if it's not choice A, it's choice B. You know what I mean? And all romance novels are basically the same. They're like, I love you. I hate you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Happy ending, right? Yeah. But so, no, I just... We're not really communists, okay? I know we got the red shirt, okay? But, like I said, these billionaires are just driving me crazy. And the whole thing is, is that they're like, I gave, um, who's the guy, um, Warren Buffett. Is that Warren Buffett, or is it? <laughs> Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. No, wait, wait a minute. Who's the billionaire? That's Warren Buffett. Okay, Warren Buffett. He's just say worth ten billion dollars. He's right? the and in, the investor. The, yeah, yeah. And he comes out all the time and says, "I'm with you, poor people. Please don't come kill me." Right? That's basically what he's saying. I gave away one billion dollars to this to Heart Association, to Land Development, to India. Oh, is he one of the one of the billionaires that says I should be taxed more? Right, right. Uh, my, my, yes, my, tax me more. My secretary pays a higher rate right. than I do. Yes, he's one of those. All right. Because what they don't want to do is end up dead and in the basement, you know, because some poor people murdered them. Mm -hmm. Okay? I gave a billion dollars away to charity. Well, you still have nine billion. Well, that, that, that's my <laughs> nine billion. I need that. Yeah, that one billion that you gave away to charity, that's to keep your nine billion so people don't string you up and go through your safe. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so... The more I listen to most billionaires, the more I'm like, you know what? They're, a lot of them are just scam artists. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, you said it before, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, and this will be on our last thing, but you have said people in your family kind of be like, well, they work harder, that's why they're rich. Mm -hmm. Okay? And when I was younger, I thought, wow, they must work super hard because they're rich. And then I find out that for the most part, Again, this is a universal statement. You can write to Beacon a speech. I'm not going to tell you the web address. You can figure it out. And for the most part, people who became billionaires were lucky and they took advantage of someone else. How many other people does Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook sue in? Like everybody who helped him with Facebook, he's like, they all got bought out or all sued him. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, how ruthless can you be to keep your billion dollars, mm -hmm. right? Well, well, then I wouldn't have been successful. Okay, not, I don't really buy that either. But it goes back to, well, what can you do? If you put a cap on capitalism, you know, there wouldn't be a Walmart in every city. Yeah. You know, everybody <clears throat> said that Sam Walton was not the brightest guy. But when it came down to Walmart... He was so focused on Walmart, he was like, how can I make Walmart grow? And that's basically screw every business I deal with and then give the customers the lowest prices so everybody has to sh shop at Walmart, right? Well, Sam Walton wasn't the smartest guy. People who met Sam Walton say he was not the sharpest guy they ever met. Hmm. But he was willing to, what can I do to screw every other company in my city so all they do is shop at Walmart? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, Walmart's global. Now all these poor people get these cheap prices. Right? Well, there, there's a flip side to that. You know, nobody's working at, nobody grows up and says, I want to work at Walmart. You know, you go to school for 12 years, and then when you graduate, like, I'm glad I work at Walmart. I'm going to work here for the next 40 years bust my back and my family's going to have a nice middle class living with me working at Walmart. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because we're not all in this together. Billionaires. Oh no. Oh no. We got the warning. We got the warning that we're glitching. Okay. Mm -hmm. I only have. Okay. Okay. I we'll, we'll like this. how they just like. Yeah. It pops up and says, <laughs> Beacon of Speech is done. It's just casually yeah, slides It says over. you are done. Okay. <laughs> we won't bitch about billionaires anymore.